Father, as we come around the living word, your written word, we have seen the living word in action. We have seen and felt your spirit, your presence, the presence of your spirit. Now come and ignite your word. And in just the simple way, in this not refined now or perfectly packaged and presented sermon, but just in these few words, let them, let them be words that will ignite fresh fire and revelation in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The message I had prepared for you tonight, which I'm going to deliver in somewhat altered form because of the way the Spirit has led, is entitled, Work, Rest, and Pray. I want to speak to you about a dilemma, even a paradox. I touched on it in the earlier services. When I was talking about Jacob alone with God, and to get to that place where he was completely alone with God required a lot of effort. He had to come to a place where he was determined to put everything else to one side and meet with God. He had to make plan and preparation so that the regular daily responsibilities as a tribal leader, as a husband and a father and a person with great responsibility for the lives of many people, put all those duties and responsibilities on one side, even regular family activity, to say, God, I'm at breaking point. I need you. And when he'd done everything that he could do, he had to just say, God, now I need you to do what only you can do. And there are two passages of Scripture, both in Matthew, that represent or at least illustrate this paradox. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Let these words speak as if they were coming directly from the lips of Jesus tonight. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Now, let's stay in Matthew, but go to the end of the, of the book to the favorite verse or passage for us in Kensington Temple. When it comes to the activity and the commission he's given us, the work he's given us to do, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, can you see the paradox? In one passage, Jesus says, rest. In the other passage, he says, work. Well, which is it, Jesus? Do we rest or do we work? And you know, I have found at times when I'm wanting to rest, people want me to work. And when I'm wanting to work... People say you need to rest. You never please people. But we can thank God that it's not like that with him. He knows how we can work and rest. And we need to look at both sides of these things. In Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do. I hope you are a can-do person. 
Amen? Kensington Temple people, I want you to be an up and Adam, a can-do type of, type of group of people. We are great doers. But it's not just about doing. He doesn't say, I can do all things. He goes on to say, I can do all things through Christ who enables me, who strengthens me. And we can see straight away that the dilemma isn't either or, it's both and. But we still get confused. Which is it? Do we work or do we rest? We have people who say, let go and let God. What is that supposed to mean? Just let go. Let God. Another one which I enjoyed hearing, don't wrestle, just nestle. That's quite nice, isn't it? How about this one? Don't strive, thrive. Love God and do as you like. Is this correct? Is there a contradiction here? Is this setting us up for some kind of creative tension? Is there a balance? Is there something that we must do at times, not let go but hold on? Is there a wrestling at times? Is there a certain kind of striving, working, energizing? Love God is a verb. Love is a verb. It's a doing word. All right. Well, both these things are true in their proper place. There is a right kind of resting and a right kind of working, just as there is a wrong kind of resting and the wrong kind of working. So how do we, how do we get this balance right? We can epitomize one by saying it's activism and the other passivism. Activism, the dangers of activism. Oh, the barrenness of a busy life. I just pause and let the Holy Spirit speak to me for a moment or two about that point. Activism, if it's taken to an extreme, can build a works-based Christian living and ends up with burnt-out service or performance-based living. Behind it's the basis that unless I do this, God isn't going to be pleased with me. I've got to do this, 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 and this, jump through these hoops, and then some before God is going to heal me, God is going to bless me. Can you see tonight, none of these people were striving for their healing. They had to do something, but I'm coming to that. They had to do something, but it was God. Now, the wrong kind of pacifism, pacifism is, le- breeds lazy Christians. Do you know, lazy Christians, they drive me crazy. I, I, I get so mad when I see lazy Christians. I just think of one, one person, just one example, It'd be nameless just because some of you may still remember. If you, if you remember I Exalt Thee from 1988, you might remember that this person used to be on the staff. He had the most amazing singing voice. And he would never use it. Well, on your own, do you sing? No. What? How can you? I would give, well, no, I wouldn't, to be able to sing like you. And you don't use it. You are lazy, lazy, lazy. If I had just even that amount of a singing voice, I've got this amount. And look what I do with it. <laughs> That's just one example. God's given you something. Use it. Don't be lazy. Sloppy, sleepy. Fruitless, do nothing, achieve nothing. We can put both that kind of activism and passivism in the sin bins. But there is a right rest. (gasps) What a word. It's better than Prozac. (laughs) The right rest, the easy yoke, yoked with Christ. You are keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. The book of Galatians speak about walking in the Spirit. One translation says, keep in step with the Spirit. You are keeping up with the Holy Spirit. And you are yoked to Christ. You are walking with Jesus. He's carrying the burden. The easy yoke. Being seated with Christ in heavenly places. Where is he seated? He is seated 
upon the triumphant throne of the universe that speaks of an accomplishment that has already taken place. It is finished. He is seated in that place of accomplishment, that place of rest. And we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, resting in His victory, resting in His authority. We are righteous, that is acceptable to God, by faith, not works. The one who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Romans 4 verse 5, putting your trust in Christ opens the door to heaven for you without you lifting a finger because there is not enough fingers on both hands to do the work that is required to get you to heaven under your own strength. Just resting in the finished work of Jesus. Hebrews 4 verse 10 says, He who has entered his rest, that's God's rest, has himself ceased from his works as God did from his. This is the Sabbath rest that we have entered into by faith. Peace with God, shalom, rest, conquest, inheritance. It's all ours because Jesus has conquered and we are ceasing from our works. That's the kind of labor we need to enter that kind of rest. That inner peace that was being ministered directly by the Holy Spirit, I felt it so tangibly on this platform and I'm pretty sure that you felt it too. Not just that I had the privilege of being right here where God, in close proximity to where God was working in people's lives, but His presence is everywhere in this place. That's the wonderful thing about the anointing. It is not in one spot. It is not focused and localized in one spot with one ministry, one hand, with one anointing. It is the presence of God through His Holy Spirit touching every corner of this place right to the balcony, in every part, the inner peace, the complete absence of striving, only trust. That's the right kind of rest. What is the right kind of work? What is it we are to do? Luke eleven twenty four 24 speaks about the narrow way. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. There is something for us to do. There's a determination. We are going to go the narrow way, the path least trod. And it's a paradox, even in this, in the spiritual life, the more we go with Jesus, the narrower the way becomes. And in another sense, the more broad and open it becomes because the opportunities of that narrowness are infinite because it's how God blesses. Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue peace. I was mugged not so very long ago. And I tell you what, I pursued that mugger. Well, there were two of them. They were a fraction of my age. I tell you what, I, I ran after them until I could run no more. And then I got into a police car and we drove around. I pursued it anyway. We didn't catch up with them, but the insurance paid, so God bless us all. <laughs> but I pursued. Pursue is an active word. It's a doing word. Pursue God. There's an up and reaching forward. As he says in Philippians 4, 3 verse 14, I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call. And there's point after point. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 27. Look it up later. Train, discipline, strive for a crown. Hebrews 4, 9 to 12. I mentioned it earlier. Labor to enter that rest. 2 Peter 1, verses 5 to 8. Add to your faith. Do something. Do something that you might bear fruit. And there is hard labor in the ministry. I love it. 1 Corinthians 5, 15 verse 10 says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and by and His grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So Paul is giving us both in one sentence there. 
It's God's grace at work. How does it all operate? It works out of faith, first of all. That's the first principle. What you do by faith works because it's about trusting God's power. Works done in faith are a response to God's grace. The fruit of our faith is a response to His goodness. It works by faith. It's motivated by love. The labor of love is not a tough labor. His commandments are not burdensome if we love Him. He who has been forgiven much loves much. We love Him because He first loved us. We depend on His love and fill of His love. It's amazing what we will do for the love of God. We will do what money won't pay us to do because we love Jesus. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Delight in the Lord. Desire is in Him. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and we are delight, delighted by Him and delighted in Him. So we say, I delight to do your will. If it's God's will, walk up a mountain, go across a thousand valleys. If it's His will, it's a delight. And it all happens, of course, through the power and enablement of the Holy Spirit. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I kind of put it like this. I, th I work like this. I say, God, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be lazy here. Show me what I must do, and I will do it. But there will come a moment, Lord, and you know it, when I'm going to have to say, God, I've done what I can do. Now do what only you can do. And the little offering talk that Daniel gave triggered a whole series of things that I've been thinking about. Let's, let's go back to that offering talk. Do you recall it? The woman, and, and she was a widow, and she was in great debt, and she came to the prophet for help because the debtors were coming. And he asked two things, what do you need? Well, what she needed, she couldn't supply for herself. She needed God. But then he also said, the prophet said, what is in your house? What do you have? Bring it. She had to do something. Her doing wasn't going to make a difference in the natural realm. But her obedience, her putting her faith into action, her doing that thing that was pointed out to do, it opened the doorway for a miracle. That's why I said, put your hand there. And the lady hadn't done it. You saw it with your own eyes. And I said, do it. So she did it. And when she did it, something happened. You saw it, didn't you, a moment ago? So, you know, sometimes we say, do this, do that, lift your hands, do this, sit down, stand up, simply out of habit. All right? You know that sometimes. But there are times when we'll say, this is what you must do. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Go do this. Do this. This. Go and bathe in the River Jordan. Go and do this. Do this. That's not going to heal you. That's not going to make the miracle happen. But because you are doing something and you are active, you are putting your faith into practice, and that triggers a miracle. Hallelujah. Amen. How about Moses? Moses was utterly helpless. And God said, what is in your hand? It's my rod. Throw it down. Even that. What's in your hand? What have you got? Put it down. Lay it down. And with it, pick it up again. And with it, go and do miracles. When there were more than 5,000 people, 5,000 men beside women and children, there was no food for any of them. They said, what do you have? We've got a little boy's lunch. Five loaves and two fishes. And this is this boy. I don't see him as a porky. I just see him as a little boy. And this is, this is, this is sardines. You know, it's this. It's this. It's not five big fish. It's a boy's lunch. Bring it to me. They had to do something. They had to take it. And the, the disciples broke it and multiplied it. Well, it multiplied in their hands. And I, I find this over and over again in Scripture, and we're coming to the end tonight. But I find that when we take 
what God has given us, what we have, the tiny little bit, it might be, might look insignificant. But if it comes from the obedience of faith, just take it. Give it. Do it. Make that telephone call. Write that letter. Say that thank you. Help that person. Do something. Put your faith into practice. And we put these two things together. God, I'm doing what you're telling me to do. I am seeing signs of something really wonderful. There are two people that I have been praying for for years. Years. I have both have reason, I have reason to see them both regularly because they offer some kind of you know, I, go, I go to the shop, I go and do. And so I have this ongoing contact, but they've become good friends. And one of them said to me, you know, all the books that you've written, I've never read one of them. <laughs> I said, no. Can I read one? I said, yes. How about this one? Salvation by grace. <laughs> God use it. Another man, for the first time, and he is interested in anything, everything, everything but Jesus. He's now reading his Bible. And he said, which is the best Bible to read? I, uh, the first one you can get hold of. And he started reading his Bible, and he asked me questions. And I gave him a Bible with a little bit of a study Bible to, because he's got an inquiring mind. You see, I've done what I can do, but it's only the Holy Spirit who can bring somebody to faith. You, you in your cell groups, don't give up. Keep on doing what you are called to do, even if you feel it's laborious and fruitless. No, because you're doing what you can do. And then you say, God, I've done what I can do. Now, do what only you can do. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In this place tonight, I want you to be able to pray that prayer with me. I want you to lift up before the Lord something where you need God Something where you say, I can't do this, God. And I want you to, to agree to, to two things. In this, I can't do this, God. He might say to you, what is in your hand? What have you got in your house? What's that in your lunchbox? And whatever he tells you, do it. Would you agree to do that? Whatever he tells you, do it. Even if it doesn't make sense, do it. I'm not talking about crazy stuff. This is not, I'm not talking about pizza prophecies. Don't do this in the middle of the night having had a cheese sandwich, okay? Let it be of the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing. And the second thing, I want you also to make this transaction now with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I invite you into this situation to do what only you can do. Supernatural. Miracle. Answer to prayer. He can turn any situation around. No matter how impossible. Oh, He is God. And there's no striving there. There's the prophets of Baal who worked up a sweat and got no response from heaven. Elijah stood back and said, let God be God, and the fire fell. That's our lives tonight, Lord. That's our lives. We need you. Holy Spirit, we obey your voice, and we say in this place, do what only you can do. 
in every situation, in every life, in every heart. In a moment, Lord, when we dismiss and we go back to our busy lives, our homes, our take up the responsibilities of this week, we want to go refreshed, resting in you, but active, sharp as a razor, to listen to your voice, to obey your spirit, and to depend 100% on you to do what we can never do, that you might do what only you can do. I leave you for a moment or two while you do your business with God right now. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs>